All right, cool. Let's get started. Hopefully everyone can hear me. This is the coolest technology that John Galloway I ever found in my entire life. Uh, I'm real excited about it. Um, we're just testing everything out. Uh, Lachlan beh is behind. You can't hear him because he's back here. He can hear me. It's very, it's very odd that I can't hear him, but he's there. Trust me. Uh, I'm super excited. We're trying out a brand new piece of tech called StreamYard for this thing. Of course, we have YouTube open over here. Oh, I see myself. Nice. Probably on a 30 second delay or so. I should probably time it. That's pretty good. Oh, that's that's trippy. Uh, we'll be uh, also monitoring the chat room, of course. A lot of good discussion going on. Uh, as always, John is here. Ari is here. A bunch of people from the community. Very cool. Uh, I'm James Montemagno. That's what it says right uh, there. Look at that. Uh, and this is the SeattleMobile.net developers group. So we actually meet up in Redmond, Washington, even though it's a Seattle, but usually on campus, we used to be downtown Seattle. And like every user group, you move around when you don't want to pay for a room and Microsoft offers you a free place to, to do your user group, which is pretty cool. Uh, and uh, we have been around for, oh, geez, four or five years, myself and Frank Kruger run the user group, although I need to let him host some and try to have him test out some of the cool new tech. Uh, so this has been pretty awesome. Uh, because we've been able to change to to, to digital and virtual uh, user group. Uh, Lachlan and I were just talking about what works well. You know, we've tried out Teams Live. We tried some Skype stuff. We are now on this new StreamYard thing with YouTube. Uh, and, you know, there's a little bit less interaction, um, obviously, than doing like a Zoom call or a Teams call or something. But, you know, we're definitely interested in your feedback. I'll try to send out a survey on the, the user groups as well to see what people think. Uh, of it. Um, but the nice thing is that since I'm not presenting and I somehow got Lachlan to dial in from Australia to do this talk, um, I can be monitoring the chat and I'll sort of be the middle individual here uh, relaying information. Um, so Lachlan is going to be giving a talk on Blazor plus Xamarin code sharing. I was excited. I saw a blog post from Lachlan uh, earlier this month, I think. And I said, well, this sounds like a cool topic. I think he did a user group on it. And that's great because he already has the content. He can just copy pasta. So pretty excited there. And of course, yeah, feel free to um, post some uh, messages there. And this is also being, oh, if, if you don't know who we are, we, we talk about all sorts of different stuff. So while we're the mobile.net developer group, we do talk about normal.net development, state of .net, .net conf stuff, iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, game development, you name it, we're here. And if you're interested in a topic, leave a, leave a chat in the chat or you send me an email. Uh, Mots at Microsoft.com, M-O-T-Z, we're there. Um, this is actually being um, partner broadcast with um, the .NET Foundation and the .NET Virtual User Group. Some of you may be coming from uh, the this meetup page, which is the .NET Virtual User Group meetup page, and uh, or from the SeattleMobile.NET User Group. Um, the goal of this was that there's a lot of different user groups happening right now all over the world that have gone virtual and what better way to promote than um, create like a mega group, you know, where every everywhere we sort of um, take all of the, any user group leader that wants to submit their meetup to this, uh, this group just opens and submits a form. And we basically just sort of re paste that in there. And what's cool about that is that you sort of open your user group up to a broader audience if you'd like to. Some user groups want to keep just very close and personal, but it's kind of nice here. And in the future, as um, the world reopens up in 2026, um, you know, we'll be able to um, have like ongoing virtual user groups uh, in a way, kind of have a connection, a friendly face of the Dunnet Foundation or other user groups that are streaming that maybe want to use this platform, which is cool. And it's also nice because we can say some information about what's going on with the .NET Foundation, which is an independent board of uh, directors with different projects and um, um, working groups. Uh, and right now, they're actually having the new .NET Foundation Board of Director elections. I've been working closely with Claire and the, the, the working group that's putting this together. I think there's like 16 or 17 uh, different um, um, candidates that um, have signed up. Some of these faces may look familiar uh, in the Xamarin community, in the .NET community. Um, some individuals, I think, from Microsoft, most not from Microsoft. 
that are there. Um, and starting tomorrow and Friday, they're actually doing live streams on the Donnet Foundation YouTube, which is where this is at. You can hit the subscribe button. And um, they're going to be doing interviews with each of the Donnet Foundation candidates, which is really cool. And you can actually see the upcoming scheduled stuff there, which is really, really nice. Um, but you can find out all about the Donnet Foundation um, by going to donnetfoundation.org and links to the different um, user or the different election stuff on there too. But definitely check in tomorrow if you're interested and see how you can get more involved with the .NET Foundation. I just became a member. John uh, Galloway convinced me to join. You can join for free. You can also give a donation if you want. You don't have to. That's kind of nice. Let's get into some announcements. I always like to kick off the uh, user group with some announcements. Uh, we should probably do full user groups and have someone from the team on to demo a bunch of stuff. Uh, but some things that have happened, the biggest one is Xamarin Forms 4.7.0. Funnily enough, last month, the big announcement was Xamarin Forms 4.6.0. So now it's 4.7.0. It increments once a month. <laughs> so it's always an announcement, uh, which I think is great. Um, and uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. There's a bunch of different improvements, simplified grids, multi-bindings, app theme improvements, some map improvements, uh, Switch has new visual states and also shapes and paths. Uh, so I thought this was pretty cool. Um, and I wanted to show off some features. And you know, oh, the, the Simon crop has arrived, which is awesome. Hi, Simon. How's it going? Hey, Samuel from, from Ghana. That's why I like opening this up. You get a bunch of amazing individuals from all over the world. Very cool. Um, one of my new favorite things, I pushed pretty hard on this, um, was simplified grids. Uh, I could not be more ecstatic about this. I'm actually going to be updating my workshop for Xamarin Forms on Friday on my live stream on Twitch. And I'm going to upgrade this because it makes it so much easier. Look at this thing. It's a thing of beauty. Take all these rows and columns and just shove them into one single line of code. Ah, so beautiful. I absolutely love it. Um, I really, really like that. Um, I think this is really neat. And it's really going to just kind of really help simplify development going forward. Uh, one of the other ones that I think is really neat that I had to have the team described to me a little bit on uh, one of the community standups, uh, which also happened here on the Donna Foundation YouTube, um, was multi bindings. And we've had bindings forever. And uh, multi bindings are this kind of crazy multiple bindings all at once. And you can apply it to anything and you can also apply converters to it. So the one on the left here is neat. It is, um, it is like a string format, which is built in and you pass it multiple data like for first name, middle name, and surname, and it just combines them together. On the right-hand side, it's actually a um, converter to say all true. And there's a code that is written in this converter like any other value converter. But what this will do is it'll take in all of the bindings which are passing as an array, and it'll check to see is it a Boolean as it, and is it set to true. Uh, but you can apply even converters to a binding. So you can do an inverter, combine, bind um, a converter as well to the binding. So this is going to say, am I over 16? Have I passed my test? And am I not suspended? Pretty much. Instead of am I suspended? Am I not suspended? To see if that's checked or not. And when you check and uncheck that, it will like update the, all bindings, which is bananas. So it's like the coolest thing ever. It's crazy. And the biggest other one besides that is paths and shapes, which are under a feature flag right now in preview. Um, there's a bunch of stuff. Think of it as system.drawing. Um, that's what it is. And it comes from a lot of the WPF and UWP implementations uh, that are out there already. So you can kind of copy and paste code. Um, and Dave is right. Dave Murray in the chat, multi-bindings are awesome. <laughs> Wanted it for ages. I didn't know how awesome it was until I saw it, especially the... The other one, which is the the all true, I was like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, this is cool because paths and shapes, you can basically do anything. You can also pipe SVG data into stuff. Um, you can add a clip of any shape to anything. So here in this login page, David has um, ellipse geometry, a circle being cut out of the image. So you no longer need a custom control, bananas. And then this shape, which is the entire outline, the white outline with the little divot, is actually this really long data like SVG from it, which is cool. So you can just pipe it right in there, um, which I think is really cool. And, and in fact, uh, 
um, I think on the Xamarin show in a few weeks, I have Javier on who worked on this from the team. He, um, he showed me, uh, like an, like using this path data and polylines, he created like artwork out of it, like photorealistic. It was crazy. It was very, very good. Simon asks, uh, let's see, I'm going to read the chat here. Any interest in getting snapshot testing working in Xamarin forms? Probably. That sounds good. I think that'd be cool. Yeah. Not sure. That'd be cool. Yeah. And Ari, that's right. Um, basically what you do is you open up the SVG and there's the, the path data inside of it and you just copy and paste it in there. So that way you don't even have to put the SVG in your thing. It just, here's a path, which is really, really cool. So those are like the ones that I'm really excited for. And there's a bunch of video and documentation on there as well, which I think is cool. Um, but I think that's super duper rad. Um, before we go to the main talk, I don't know if anyone else had any questions or any announcements, you can just post them uh, into the chat room as well. So maybe you're working at a company that's hiring or you're looking for some stuff, um, you're looking for a job or maybe you're looking for some Q and A, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, but we'll give the YouTube's 30 seconds to, 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 to to go around. And while I do that, we'll bring in Lachlan. How's it going, Lachlan? Hi there. Doing good. Doing good. How about you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Now I'm just seeing if this works. There we go. Like it's bring you in like, hey, do, 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 do. And then check this out. Do, 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 do. Oh, I go big. Yep. Look at that. Now we're just hanging out. Oh, now you got small. Oh, oh look at this. Oh, oh. Whoa. Whoa. Um, amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I have too much fun with the um, <laughs> with the this thing. I don't know why. It's it's quite amazing and awesome at the same time. You can check this out because we can also do whoa. We're gonna get some angry letters if we just spend an hour making our faces bigger and smaller. Probably, probably. Um, Ari says Find we'll out. be talking about .NET Maui next week on Indie Xamarin, which will be there too. It'll be in the the virtual group. John just posted a link on there too. That's cool. Yeah. I haven't even presented on that. I did a I did a little bit of an intro last um, last month, kind of a build recap on there too. So, yeah. Well, Lachlan, thank you for Sweet joining. For that. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, How are you doing? Happy to be here. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Staying at home a lot. That's Same. <laughs> How yeah. it is in Melbourne and a lot of places right now. But yeah, yeah. doing good. I got my mask. Got my mask back here. I always got, always got it in hand, mask up. So very important. Wear your mask um, all the time. I just walk out. Well, I check the check the mail. Wear my mask. I don't even leave the house. I'm wearing my mask around everywhere. So um, John says that this needs to be on late night cable access. There we go. We could do a uh, check this out. We could do like a green screen background. Let's look at this. Oh, ooh. that is green. That's green. It's not really great. I can put. Oh, look at that. I can put a banner up there. That's cool. Ah, that's nifty. Or you'd be like, oh, powered by StreamYard. Anyways, Lachlan, um, I could introduce you, but I actually, surprisingly, besides me interacting with you in Twitch, I don't necessarily know. I, I mean, I just randomly tweeted, I just randomly DM'd Lachlan, slid into his DMs, and I said, do you want to present the user group? I don't know if that was a good idea or not, but we're about to find out. So maybe, Lachlan, you want to give everyone a little <laughs> sure, bit of so. introduction about yourself before you talk about your talk? Sure thing. So I'm Lachlan Gordon. I live in Melbourne, Australia. I'm a freelance Xamarin dev, or that's what I called myself until recently, but I'm dabbling in Blazor a lot lately. So maybe toying with the idea of calling myself a .NET app dev, something like that. I like that. Um, I also play the double bass. You can just see that off in the corner there. Oh, cool. And I also um, sing in a sea shanty group called Chantilly Clad. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> uh, haven't had a gig in a while, but we'll be back out there soon. Um, you know, do a bit of audio now? engineering stuff as well. We, yeah, with, we would like to do a virtual gig once we can get the band all in the same place again. Um, and yeah, just do a lot of Xamarin, have a lot of fun. I stream on Twitch as well. Um, do kind of a weekly-ish 
kind of testing out new stuff, whatever I learn in meetups. And then also uh, another session once a week with my friend Kim Philpotts. We, we're working on an app pair programming live. We do a lot of bike shedding, not all that much code, but it's a lot of fun. Very cool. Now, um, I got to ask though, like what, what made you interested in, in Blazor coming, coming over because you've been a Xamarin dev for a while? Um, basically I love C sharp and I want my apps to run everywhere. So worked at a few companies over the past few years and we've had a Xamarin mobile app and a dotnet backend and some kind of web front end that sits on that mix of Microsoft and various JavaScript technologies. And it always kind of really frustrated me that if we wanted to get some new property on an object, we'd have to get the mobile developer and a front end developer and a back end mm. developer to all agree on that. And we weren't really doing any code sharing, even though two of those things were C sharp. And mm. so, and I made a web, did a web project a couple of years ago, even though I'm more of a mobile developer, um, made it for the local community legal centers to help them manage their fines. And that really needed to be a website. It wasn't feasible to distribute that as a mobile app and they needed mm. the big screen. So I built that in with a view front end and a .NET Core back end. Um, and that all worked fine, but I kind of just had to fumble my way through JavaScript. So mm. then when I heard about Blaze, I'm like, yes, this is for me. I can nice. share all that code. Um, and conveniently, uh, one of my co-organizers of the Melbourne meetup, Rod, uh, runs an agency, Melbourne App Development. And he kind of saw the same thing of, we've been doing Xamarin, but we need web. Mm. Let's do Blazor. So there was a job there for someone who was interested in both. So it'll quite a bit of work for him as well. Nice. Yeah, I've... um. I also, I dabbled a little bit in Blazor and I it felt a little bit more natural than doing um, pure like razor pages and, and just, or MVC. I think MVC was a little bit more complicated for me to understand. I think I understood the web assembly Blazor more than the server. I had a hard, I have the hard time with the internet, which is like, I, I remember trying to build my first ASP.NET uh, MVC app and I asked my, my wife, who's an ASP.NET developer. I was like, I don't understand. Like, click this button, like, but where is like, where is that code running? Right. Cause on a mobile app, like it's running in the phone, like it's in the phone. She's like, it's on the server. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. She's like, I'm like, how does a button click go over that? Like, it, is, it doesn't, doesn't compute. Like I was, I was, I was having a very hard time understanding that like things happen on a server when like on my mobile device, like everything happens in the mobile device. Like when I did some blazer web or something, I was like, I get this a little bit more ish. I would say different syntax, but I think you make a good point, which is like, um, I've always considered my call myself like a .NET developer. Like I'm just a .NET developer and I just specialize in client development or Xamarin development or mobile development, right? Like if I needed to go write a website, I could probably do it or backend, right? Like kind of. So I think hopefully maybe you think about it that way too. Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I started off my C sharp journey doing MVC stuff and that was kind of cool and I liked C sharp but then I was also dabbling in iOS with Swift and Java and Android and then fresh out of uni a friend of mine's like there's this job going where you get to write C sharp and you write mobile apps and they'll run on iOS and Android I'm like what no that's not possible <laughs> um so yeah got that job like this is amazing why did no one tell me about Xamarin? <laughs> um, and yeah, stayed there for three years, had a great time. Never looked back. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I will let you get into it. We had a few questions in the chat. A lot of people are very excited for Blazor. Ismo Ease, was very excited. Also, um, let's see, Samuel was asking what software we're using. We're using StreamYard, which is an in-browser craziness it's just using WebRTC. Let's just be honest. And mostly what it's using. So it's kind of cool. But uh, 
All right. Well, it I went it out. very easy for the presenters. I just clicked a link and I was in. Yeah. I like that. That was, that was the neatest part. Like no, no Skype or OBS Ninja or any, or anything. It's just like, here's a link and you're in. So, um, very cool. It's a little bit more limiting though, right? Like we were, Lachlan like really helped me out because we spent a good like 20, 30 minutes in the beginning just like beta testing stuff. But anyways, I will let you, I will flip up your screen. Check this out. Boom. Um, put that, <laughs> I get excited and then check this. Let's see if this works. Oh, that doesn't hey, work. It's me. It's you again. Okay. Oh, how do I? Nothing works. Nope. <laughs> no. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Let me see if I can. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. See, it's not perfect. <laughs> so it looks like you got to look at my, look at me. I'm going to remove myself for a bit and then I'll, I'll pop back in if I have questions and you'll see me. How's that sound? Sounds good. Thank you, James. All right. And I will be monitoring the chat. So please, please, please give people um, and the, everyone in the chat room and the user group, give Lachlan your questions um, and I will be, I'll be relaying them over. Without that, Lachlan, go for it. Cool. Well. Welcome everyone. Um, so I'm going to be looking at how I've been sharing code between Blazor and my Xamarin Forms apps. Um, had enough intro about me, so let's get straight into it. So I'm going to start with a quick intro of what Blazor is and an even quicker intro of Xamarin Forms. Not going to get bogged down too much in that. But then when we get into how they the two kind of work together, I just want to make sure everyone's got a bit of that base knowledge. Um, I'm kind of guessing a lot of people in the chat have been using Xamarin for years but are new to Blazor, but maybe some of you are the other way around. So let's level the playing field. <laughs> so what I'll be looking at, um, what we'll be using for these demos, the sample app, um, is one I've been working on live on Twitch um, for our Melbourne Xamarin and Blazor meetup. So it's basically a list of presenters, and that will be expanded to having links into uh, presentations and a bunch of resources. And I'm running it, you can see it there in Chrome using Blazor. And for Xamarin Forms, I've got it on my Android and iOS. The other app I'll be looking at, which I've done basically the same thing, where we've got Blazor and Xamarin for iOS and Android. I uh, did this as part of the um, Cognitive Services plus Xamarin Challenge uh, set up by Gerald Sly and Matthew Soka. Um, so my entry for that was to add a Blazor front end. So I'll be referring to that a bit as well. Um, both of these are open source up on GitHub and there are links at the end of the presentation. Cool. So it's a quick Blazor intro. Uh, new single page application framework uh, from Microsoft. Um, you get the right .NET code. Um, for me, that's C sharp. But if you're into other languages, that's cool too. Um, and a whole lot less JavaScript to use that right. It's a little bit now and then, but basically C sharp in the browser. Uh, you can run it two ways. Uh, WebAssembly is the cool, hot new thing of uh, running other languages inside the browser. Some of the big advantages there are cheap hosting because you just get to um, any old static file storage. It'll work offline once it's loaded. Kind of the main downside is the first load is a bit slow. Um, or you can run all that same Blazor code on the server and that connects using SignalR and it spins up super fast you also can talk straight to your database without having to have an API in between them. Um, does need a really good internet connection though. So that's kind of a quick summary of the two situations. But whatever code you write for Blazor in one, you can run it in the other. So don't get too bogged down in choosing one when you start working on a project. Code's easy to reuse. Um, <laughs> sorry, Alex, I don't have Windows Phone in there. I do most of my work on a Mac. Um, I'll make sure for my next presentation, I've got Windows Phone as well, or UWP desktop. I did uh, recently move out um, some of my office stuff. I was rearranging, and I, I found my old Lumia 521, I think. So it's my original dev device. I was very excited about it. So 
Did you shed a tear? A little bit. It was a uh, hit me right here, right in the heart. So, so James, I started. just when you brought your camera back on, then uh, you, the first half of your sentence got cut off. So maybe for future questions, take a pause. That's a great idea. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Actually, we got some good questions. One, Simon does miss Windows Phone. We all do. Ari asks, how solid does low, maybe the signal R, does lower yes, bandwidth cause issues? issues? Um, lower bandwidth doesn't seem to be much of a problem. It's more about if it drops in and out. So the way signal R is communicating, instead of just one API request, whenever you submit a form or something like that, every little thing that happens on the page, whether you click on a field or click on a button, every bit of validation and logic is a really quick round trip using mm -hmm. WebSockets. So mm -hmm. if you just typing in a, if you're typing in a text field, not even submitting yet, um, and there are ways around some of these things, but just that sort of thing, um, if the internet drops out momentarily, you'll just get kind of a milky overlay saying connection lost. Um, but the actual payload going back and forth is absolutely tiny. It's just sending the tiniest little browser DOM diffs and a lot of chat keeping things alive. Got it, got it. Other question before you move on, since you had those comparisons, I think those comparisons are always a billion questions uh, around what thing to use. I think that. I probably need to, there's probably a doc. I'll see if I can find it. But someone was asking um, initial payload, like for the web assembly. I've found it's, I think for a hello world, it's around three meg. So not that much. I've found the web assembly stuff I put up there typically around uh, five meg um, once I've got a few things in there. Um, at the moment when it loads, it does load your entire app in. So if you had a really big complex web app with lots and lots of pages and lots of nougats, that could take quite a while to load. Um, I haven't seen any work on this, but I've kind of got to assume someone's thinking about how to make that a bit more dynamic and only loading in the bits of WebAssembly when they need them hmm. or at least get the first load super fast. Got it. Um, there are also some people thinking about how to make it. Um, I think I've forgotten what the word is. They've got a word for it when you're working in Node um, where your code can kind of switch between running server side or client side dynamically. So what I really want to see is when you go to the website, you've got full Blazor interactivity instantly like you do with um, server-side Blazor, and then over the next 30 seconds or whatever, there's a service worker gradually loading in all the DLLs. And then once you've got it all there, you can turn off that signal R connection and go mm. purely client-side. Got it. But we're not quite there yet. For the moment, you kind of got to host it one way or the other. But while you're working, you can make sure your code will work in either later. Got it. So got it. that's kind of how we got started at work. Our goal is we want to end up WebAssembly, but mm. WebAssembly took a bit longer to go stable, um, whereas the server side uh, went live almost a year ago now. So we decided, even in the preview days of server, we'll start building apps for clients server side now, and then when it's ready, we'll port all that code over to client side. Uh, so you can sort of mix and match in or transition, I would say, back and forth based on your needs. Yeah, um, you kind of got to be a bit aware of how you architect your apps if you're doing that. So when I say here, um, with server-side, you can connect to your SQL database. Because your server is probably in the same Azure data center as your database is, hmm. you just do that like any old server-side thing. Whereas if you start doing that in your WebAssembly client, you're not going to have a good time. You don't want that kind of connection happening straight mm. from the client. Got so it. you want to go through an API. So you will want to put any of those database calls behind some kind of data services or repository pattern. Don't put SQL in your 
in your, in your um, thing. rise of views. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Like, don't put your private API keys in your mobile app. So, yeah, yeah, so, makes sense. Cool. All right, I will continue on. I think there's some good conversation going on, but I think those are most of the questions. And I will go away. Oops, cool. I did, it didn't work. And <laughs> um, one from Simon. But the main assembly battle tool doesn't come from a CDN, right? Um, when you're we're talking WebAssembly, I'm guessing there. Uh, the way I've hosted them, I do put my WebAssembly on a CDN, so I've got it hosted uh, probably in Azure Blob Storage static websites, and then I'll use the Azure CDN in front of that, um, which makes loading super fast. But with all your DLLs, you can kind of host them any way you would static web content. Cool. Ah, okay, so apparently no CDN is the official answer, but I can tell you that I'm doing it. <laughs> um, okay, so as a quick intro on how to use Blazor, not going to go too much into this, but just so that the um, rest of the demos make sense. We're writing the CSHTML language um, with Razor syntax, um, and that's the same thing that's been in .NET for maybe 10 years now. And we're basically looking at C-sharp and HTML mixed together. So you can see there the H1 and the P, just like any old HTML. But then when you've got basically anywhere you see an at symbol, it's going to be doing something c sharpy. So there we've got at code. That's just pure C-sharp right in there. Um, that increment count that you see up in the on click, that is linked straight to the C-sharp. Um, so here's a bit more of a complex example. So we're using Razor Pages. Um, and there you can see this at if we've got uh, vm.items equals null. Um, and then further down, we've got a for each, and that's plain C sharp syntax inside there. And then you can say, I say at presenter, and then just do any C sharp on that object like I would, and it'll end up inside that HTML image tag. Good uh, question here on that um, app page from Ari says, can you pass parameters to pages? Yes, you can. Um, so that uses kind of route syntax. So I don't have one there, but what you would see is slash counter slash, um, you could put that current count in there. Mm. And we'd mark that as a parameter with an attribute. And then um, you kind of pass them through there. So we'll be looking at an example of that later on. Got it. Cool. Cool. So in those first few examples, I had um, the C sharp code block uh, just within that dot razor file. Um, I prefer to put all my code in a code behind partial class with a dot razor dot CS extension. So if you're used to Xamarin forms, it's a lot like, hey, you've got a XAML on a XAML CS. Um, if you put all your C sharp code in the code behind file, um, kind of keeps them separate a bit better, but you can just write it in the dot razor. Um, one of the big reasons I like to split the two is IntelliSense works a lot faster if it can only think about a C sharp file rather than trying to think about HTML and Razor and all that all at once. Um, also keeps the code just a bit easier to think about what am I really doing at this point in time and to separate your concerns. So we had those HTML tags. We've also got some components built into Razor or you can get components from third party libraries. So this input text, for example, that's a Razor component that comes built into the Blazor framework as opposed to the P tag, which is just plain HTML. So they've generally got a few helpers to make things easier to um, connect to your C-sharp code, but they do just render down to HTML. So you could just write HTML there if you wanted. Um, so here's a few examples of some built-in components. If you put in a Blazor input text, it renders down to a um, 
input tag in HTML. You've got input text area, input numbers, input checkbox. They mean that you can forget about kind of the semantics of exactly how to use it in HTML and write it in um, a much more idiomatic .NET kind of way for people who are used to other .NET uh, UI frameworks. Cool. So here's the navigation we started talking about before. Um, so you put the at page directive on a page, and then you can either navigate it to it with a nav link, which we can see here. So this is kind of the sidebar in a um, Blazor navigation page or the top bar. Or And so you just put a reference of counter, and that'll open that page. Or if you're doing it from your C sharp, you're just going to call navigation manage dot navigate to and put a URL in there. Cool. So one of the important pieces of uh, Blazor, um, in particular with how I'm going to be sharing the code, and it's also been um, a big part of how people like to write .NET core stuff for a long time, or .NET stuff for a long time, is your dependency injection. Um, so this is going to be inside your startup CS or your program.cs. Um, and if I'm going to use an HTTP client anywhere in my app, I'm going to put in here, add an HTTP client, or if I've got any other services, I do that. Then within my pages, I can use this inject attribute, and it'll give me an HTTP client or a navigation manager or any other resource I want. Uh, you can also use constructor injection um, or you can resolve it at runtime, um, however you like to do it. I'm using the um, Microsoft extensions dependency injection because that's kind of baked into .NET Core. But you can use any old uh, IOC that you like. JS interop so is a really important part of how Blazor works. With C Sharp and the mono runtime running in WebAssembly, that doesn't really let you touch any parts of the user interface or the browser DOM, the document object model. It just gives you a sandbox where you can execute .NET code. When you want to actually make changes, interact with the browser and the user, it all goes through the JavaScript runtime. Most of the time, you don't need to know that detail. You can just write your um, interface using Razor syntax. But then if you want to do anything JavaScript-y that isn't built into Blazor, you can use this JS interrupt and interrupt and just send any JavaScript out you like or call any JavaScript function. So my example here, I'm just got a console.log hello JS in line in a string. Um, that kind of inline JavaScript probably isn't how you'll work most of the time. You're more likely to have a JavaScript file in your app, and you'd pass in a method name and some arguments. So I, I had a question actually on that. Um, cool. So, so does that mostly mean that if I'm, I still, even though the idea of Blazor is like that, I don't really need to be concerned about JavaScript, I'm still writing a website in which I probably still need to be concerned a little bit about JavaScript. Like, what's been your interactions with JS Interop and the apps that you've built? Has it been a lot or a little? Or like, has the community filled some space there? It's been a little. And there are more and more nougats popping up that mean you have to write less and less. Mm. Um, so one example, um, which we'll get to at a demo at some point anyway, but I can show you now. Here in this Travel Monkey app, where I've got an image that's changing every 20 seconds or something like that, in your Blazor um, code, you can put an image with a background on it. Mm. But kind of that interaction of changing the image based on a timer without having to re-render the whole page, I had to do that through JavaScript. Mm. Another bit where it became important was if I'm using the um, webcam APIs, there is actually a Nougat that lets me do this. Um, mm. 
but that Nougat's got to have some C-sharp and some JavaScript in it. So hopefully most of the JavaScript will be written by library developers and mm -hmm. you won't have to write much in your app. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, the Xamarin. You're have to. It's like the Xamarin essentials of and plugins of Xamarin. Like instead of calling native code, you're calling JavaScript code, kind of. Exactly. Okay. Um, so in the mobile app, when we add a picture, it's using an excellent media plugin, which you might be familiar with. Heard of that, um, that one. But that doesn't work in Blazor yet. So I implemented it in um, using a mix of JavaScript code. Well, actually, I think I managed to get away with just using um, the uh, a nougat that someone's put out. I didn't have to write any JavaScript for that. But then a lot of the things that are in Xamarin Essentials, I'm writing in JavaScript. Got it. So, yeah. But more and more, you'll just be able to bring in a nougat instead of um, writing JavaScript. Got it. Are you that... kind of custom user interfacey and like animation sort of stuff? You'll probably want to. Got it. Uh, Ari was asking if there's any performance implications with, especially with like the server bits, although I guess it happens locally, but that was the only question in there. Yeah, there are some interesting performance implications and some performance things matter server side and some matter when you're doing the WebAssembly version. Mm. So one example was when I was trying to do this um, webcam stuff server side, it was really struggling because it was trying to stream all that video over SignalR. And mm. SignalR is meant for very fast, um, small payloads, and it was just really struggling to send video content. That's not really meant to be its job. Um, whereas when I tried running this in uh, WebAssembly, no problems at all. It just flies along. Mm. Um, Anything that gets kind of computationally intensive, which is purely in the C-sharp world, if you're running it server-side, you've got the infinite power of the cloud, whereas if you're running it client-side, you're limited by the device. And the device might be a 15-year-old cheap desktop computer, or it might be five-year-old iPhone, or it might mm. be a super-fast computer. You just don't know. But no. yeah, the that JS interrupt bridge is much faster on WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, um, whereas it's a bit slower on server, but it can do other things faster, Got or it. database calls as well. If it's in the server, that'll be quick. So while any code you write can be run in either place, you kind of need to think about are there implications. And if you're planning on running it in both, you're going to need to test it on both. Kind of like when you've got a Xamarin Forms app. If you spend all your time getting it perfect on Android and then it doesn't really work on iOS, even though got it's it. mostly the same. You've got to go back and forth, test both if you got want it. to run it in both. Or if you're just planning on running it in one, that's fine. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you, sir. Cool. Cool. So we kind of touched on this a bit already. There are lots of third-party components, or kind of only a handful at the moment, but they're more and more popping up all the time. Um, I highly recommend Matt Blazer. It brings material design components into Blazer, and it's not just bringing in material design. It's a really good UI toolkit with lots of controls. The stuff that's kind of baked into Blazer is fairly small. They assume you'll do all the styling yourself and it's you can do anything webby but you need to kind of know your way around styles to cheats and stuff like that matte blazer is a really good place to get started if you're used to writing xamarin forms with controls that kind of already look finished and especially if you're using visual material in your mobile app um, having the material components for blazer as well helps to get those two consistent um, also, some really cool stuff coming out of Syncfusion, Telerik, and Infragistics, um, and probably a bunch of others who I forgot to mention. 
and lots of cool uh, kind of independent uh, nougats coming out. They seem to be more targeting the um, kind of JavaScript browser um, interactions for those kind of APIs rather than being UI toolkits, but there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Um, and a lot of these things are open source, so go out there and get involved. And the other thing is Nougat, if there's a C Sharp or any .NET Nougat out there, that'll run in your .NET code. If it's got desktop or mobile specific UI stuff in there, that's not going to work. But anything that's just plain C Sharp, you've got the whole world of Nougat available to run in the browser. And because of that JavaScript interrupt, any JavaScript library, you can just drop straight in there as well. So we're in a pretty nice place in terms of we can do anything. Um, I just mentioned that. Matplotlib is great. Lots of cool components, pop-ups, cards, material font icons are in there as well. Um, so there's a bit of an example of what a form would look like um, writing it out in Matplotlib. So that edit form tag is just part of Blazor. And then all these ones that start with Matt have come from Material, uh, from Matt Blazor. And they've got very uh, .NET kind of ways of putting all these properties on it, whereas otherwise you'd be doing CSS and webby stuff. Cool. So that's kind of the end of the quick intro to Blazor. Um, there's a question in the chat about Skier Sharp. Skier Sharp is coming. It's not quite there yet, but Matthew Leibowitz is working hard. Um, I've heard that it does work server-side, although I haven't actually used it yet. Um, I do use Skier Sharp a lot in my mobile apps, so I'm super keen to get it in there. Um, Uno platform have got Skia Sharp WebAssembly working in their stuff. So you can go and do that now. Or from watching the GitHub issues and Matthew Leibowitz's Twitter account, Skia Sharp WebAssembly Blazor is getting very close. Um, so there's perhaps another example of when we'll need to think about that JavaScript bridge. If you've got kind of animations and stuff going on inside your skier sharp um, or if you're presenting data on a map or a graph if you're sending um, if you're trying to do like in a mobile app you're probably going to be using skier sharp trying to get it animating at 30 or 60 frames a second if you're trying to send a list of 100 complex c sharp objects over the bridge 60 times a second that's just not going to work at all server-side, um, whereas you'd probably get away with that or at least a decent frame rate client-side. So you're going to need to start thinking about, should I be telling Skia Sharp to update that many times a second from C Sharp or should I pass across a big object that's got all the information to the client-side so that it can, it's got all that information there and then that can all be happened all be managed client side, even if you're using server side Skia Sharp. So that'll be interesting. And it's something that I've been thinking about, but not actually doing with a lot because I've been doing some pretty high performance Skia Sharp mobile stuff and trying to get everything I can out of it. And um, so, yeah, and we're going to want to put that on the web soon as well. So it's coming. Cool. I think I've got all the Blazor questions so far. So Xamarin Forms, um, awesome cross-platform user interface library. You get to write your app once in .NET. Um, so C Sharp and XAML is my preferred way of doing it and run it everywhere. And everywhere is iOS, Android, UWP, Linux, TVs. Um, there are ways to run it in the web as well. Um, so yeah, that's how I like to write my mobile and desktop apps. Um, that's the Xamarin Forms intro, although I'm also going to quickly touch on how MVVM works. Um, and this is looking at Xamarin Forms app. 
So the MVVM is model view view model. Up the top left, you can see my model class. Um, so that's a presenter. Um, that's not an MVP model view presenter type thing. That is a person who presents at a meetup, like me or James. Uh, then the view here, we've split across a XAML file, which is bottom left, and also a C sharp code behind, which is top right. So that's kind of how you write a view in Xamarin Forms. So we've got a scroll view and a stack layout and then labels and entries and that sort of stuff. Um, the code behind is fairly minimal. I'm keeping as much logic in my view model as possible. Um, the code behind is just kind of there to wire things up. And then this XAML is how the layout works. And then I've got my view model, which is where I'm putting, um, well, between my view model and my model is where I'm putting as much business logic as possible. And the view model kind of joins those two together. Um, so that's kind of where I'm loading in data, saving things, validating, that sort of stuff. So where this is about to become really important is I want this view model to run in Blazor and in my Xamarin Forms app. And the same with my model. So, oh, are we about to get a question? Or are we just looking at my face? <laughs> we'll find out. So just, this just is looking a, at you. Just looking at you. Hi, friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a diagram of kind of how the first company I worked at for a few years worked and how actually no. This is a diagram of the dark old days where you had to write an iOS app that was completely done in one language, an Android app completely in one language. Windows app all in one language, a web app in JavaScript or something, and server side, hopefully in .NET. Then a kind of everything talked through APIs, but was very disconnected. Then Xamarin came along, and we can start having our shared business logic layer. So this is what people will call Xamarin native or classic Xamarin. Um, at this point, we're kind of getting C sharp in a few more places, but what most companies were doing is only sharing that C sharp for their business logic on the mobile apps. Then came Xamarin Forms, which is where we get shared UI as well. So you can kind of see here this blue region of the graph is getting bigger and bigger with each iteration. And we've just got these little iOS, Android, UWP head projects with hopefully not too much in them. Um, so you can share your UI and your business logic as much as possible. But you've still got a web app with no um, kind of shared code and a server that might be sharing some bits between them um, and your database connection. What I've been doing um, and that we're going to be looking at is shared business logic across um, your web and mobile and desktop. Um, and that's all in C Sharp. We've got a C Sharp and XAML UI that's across three of our targets. Um, and the database is also using those same models shared between them. So this is C Sharp running everywhere, as much code reuse as possible. And it's so much fun. So you've probably seen kind of various versions of these two graphs um, in a lot of intro to Xamarin presentations. I'm taking it one step further now and making that C sharp blob huge. So now I'm getting into how I've been doing the Xamarin forms and Blazor code sharing. Um, I'll start by emphasizing that this is just one way of doing it. Lots of people are experimenting with lots of different ways. Um, and I've kind of built on the architecture of how so many people worked out how to do cross-platform in the early days of Xamarin. And they were learning from how people used to do it in C++ and oh, still do. So um, lots of opinions of how I say I do it. Um, but I want to say just because I'm saying I use this 
IOC or I use this MVVM framework. There are so many good nougats out there. So many of these will be interchangeable. They're all awesome. Um, I'm super keen to see what's going to happen in the next year or so with Maui coming out and different people working on different frameworks. This .NET code sharing is just going to be so cool. Um, question there in the chat, will Maui play into this? The answer is definitely yes, but I don't know exactly how it will yet. Um, the launch of Maui will probably just be targeting uh, Mac desktop, Windows desktop, iOS, and Android. Um, but it's the way it's being architected is really opening things up to make a web assembly um, backend available. Um, or even if that doesn't happen, or maybe if it doesn't happen for a while, the way I'm doing this code sharing here will fit just fine in Maui um, when we got Maui instead of forms. Um, but hopefully then even more cool things for even more sharing are going to happen. So the way I been putting things together is I've got a core project, which is a .NET standard library. And that's where I'm putting my models, my services, my view models. So basically, all the code that is that I want to be able to reuse everywhere and that doesn't have any dependency on Xamarin Forms or on iOS or Android or on WebAssembly or any of that web stuff. So it's got to be that uh, highly portable code. Um, We've then got a Blazor WebAssembly project, um, which is where I write any of the web stuff, a forms project. So that's where I'm putting my XAML views and all the kind of mobile app sort of stuff. And then we've got the iOS and Android projects that have that are just head projects, which are where you put your renderers and your uh, hardware API access and that sort of stuff. But hopefully you don't have to write too much code in those projects. So I'm going to change over to Visual Studio now and show you a bit of how that all plays out. Um, definitely, as we have been already, which is great, lots of questions of anything in particular you want to look at. Um, but then I will be going back to some more slides and focusing in on different parts of how I solve certain programs of code sharing. Do you want to make your fonts uh, just a tiny bit bigger? Sure thing. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Can I? Yes, I can even make the solution font bigger. And we don't really need any debug window at the moment. So that's the core. That's the .NET standard library we talked about. Just got two models in there so far, but obviously that'll grow. Then I've got services. So that's kind of where I've got my data stores. Um, and I've also got a few interfaces in here, which get implemented, and my view models. So the presenter's view model, for example, this is going to look a lot like your view model you're used to writing in Xamarin Forms. A um, couple of things to note is if you're using the Xamarin Forms command implementation, you won't be able to do that anymore because uh, this core project doesn't have a dependency on Xamarin Forms because it doesn't run in WebAssembly. So instead, I'm using the lovely James Montemagno's MVVM helpers. Um, he's got async commands in there as well, which I'm a big fan of. But even if you don't want the async command, you're just going to need a command implementation. Or you can also write your own. Um, it's not too much code. But when I thought about writing my own, I was like, eh, I'm just going to copy James's, so I might as well bring in the Nougat. Um, and so I've got my load items command and how to do some navigation as well. Um, so there's an example of passing through some IDs, although that is using my navigation service, not the Blazor one directly. Then when I look over in the forms project, I've got my views. So there's some XAML. 
with the XAML CS code behind. I've also got a couple of services or only one service. So anything that has to be implemented in a Xamarin Forms way. So something that either has a dependency on Xamarin Forms or is um, the way it'll be done for iOS and Android and UWP, that'll live in that services folder. And then when I look at my Blazor WASM project, I've got my pages in here. So the presenters page, I've got this Razor file. Um, uh, Ari asks, will this approach support shell? It sure will. And in fact, shell makes your life a whole lot easier. So um, I'm using a shell here, which has just got two tabs down the bottom of that. And I'm using the shell URI navigation as well. Um, then up in the WebAssembly one, if I look in this shared folder, I've got a nav menu dot razor class, which is kind of doing a very similar thing to shell in that it's where I declare these are basically my tab items of I've got my home page and then I've also, which oh, they've got the presenters page and also an about page. Uh, just thinking about routing could translate well. Yes, it sure does. And I'll be showing you that in a second. You're one step ahead of me. Um, so back in that presenters razor page, you can see I start by doing an if check to make sure things are initialized. And if they're not, I'll show a loading. And then that's all plain HTML of kind of a few uh, static things on my web page. And then I was so surprised when I saw this the first time, but this is just how Razor its index works. I just do an at for each and then iterate over a list of items. And then within that loop, I've got some HTML and also some Blazor components, and that's what gets rendered out. And I'll swap back over to what this actually looks like. Where is that Chrome? Uh, this one. So there's that list of people. You click on one, there's their details. In iOS, we've got basically the same thing implemented, but I've implemented all that view in XAML. And that's also all that shared code, exactly the same code running here on Android. So it's the XAML that's and the Razor that are separate, but all of the view model and the data services to get that stuff in, that's what I've shared between them. Now let's stay in here and see what's up next. Okay, so dependency injection, I touched on that before um, in terms of how it's used in Blazor. I'm using that here as well. Um, I'm using the Microsoft extensions dependency injection. Um, I've also used dry AOC and that works great on Blazor and Xamarin Forms as well. So take your pick. They're all pretty much just written in, dot, they're all pretty much .NET standard compliant. So anything that's .NET standard, you can use. So sometimes my view models are going to need to call code that'll be slightly different depending on when I'm uh, on what platform I'm on. So navigation, for example, on um, the mobile, that's going to use maybe shell or maybe a navigation page. And on Blazor, it's going to be done using um, the navigation manager. Or as I mentioned before with the camera, that's going to be, I can't use the media plugin in um, the Blazor stuff. Um, so I'm going to have to implement that stuff myself. But if I want that to be called from my view models, I'm going to need to inject an alternative dependency. Um, so I set that up in my app XAML CS, 
when I'm working in Xamarin Forms or the Program CS or perhaps Startup CS, depending on how you set up your Blazor. Give me one moment. I've got some cat shenanigans going on here. <laughs> Every, every user group is better with some more animals. That's what I like to say. Yeah. This is Ario. Ario, say hello. Oh, you can't quite see her. <laughs> Cats, oh, we've they got do a their own here thing. as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> so um, some of the implementations will be shared, though. So for example, with my data services layer, I'm injecting them, but they'll be exactly the same across my Xamarin Forms project and my Blazor project. Um, I've got that all wired up in my solution, but if you want documentation on wiring up dependency injection in Xamarin Forms, just type James Montemagno Xamarin dependency injection into Google and you'll find it. So what that looks like here in my app XAML CS, no? Ah. Didn't do it that way in this one, but I did in this one. In my Blazor WebAssembly program.cs. Ah, there's a link in the chat. Excellent. I've got my HTTP client. I also register a singleton for my presenter data store and a transient for my view model. So anytime a page wants a view model, it um, once a presenter view model, it gets one of these, which means it can also ask for the data store. Um, and then I've also got the iNavigation service, and they are implemented differently on the two. So that's where I register them all in my program CS, in my app XAML CS. We can see I'm now registering a different navigation service, but those view models, when I register them, they're exactly the same, and same with this data store. So given some of them are reused, I could put those three lines of code in somewhere reusable maybe, but it doesn't really feel worth it given it's a mix of, it's only a few lines and some of it's reusable, some of it's not. Um, let's see. So Alexander was asking if you can use other DI services and and also I would add on to that. Like he was asking about Autofact, but like, is there a reason that you went with this, the, the Microsoft extensions one instead of other ones? The main reason I went with the Microsoft one is when you go file new Blazor, it's all wired up for you already. Um, and a few things like the JS interop and the navigation manager, they're all added to the service collection automatically or not automatically. Someone at Microsoft wrote some useful code to put that all in there for me. Um, so it's there by default in Blazor, which meant I only had to implement adding it into Xamarin Forms. Um, whereas if you're using a different one, you'd need to do all that wiring up for um, both of them. But I have also experimented with uh, Dry IOC, and that works great. Um, I was mainly using that because I was using Prism as well. Um, so. Some bits of Prism work great in Blazor, um, but any of the stuff that's forms dependent obviously won't work. But I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the MVVM frameworks start supporting Blazor soon. Although kind of the way Blazor was built with the DI collection baked in already, um, there's kind of less motivation for some of the MVVM frameworks to go there because um, Blazor already does things close to what the MVVM frameworks bring anyway. Um, so yeah, as long as it's .NET standard, you can do anything you like. Next thing we're gonna look at, and we've already hinted at this a few times already, is navigation. So I like to handle my navigation in my view models. Um, some people like to put it in the view layer, um, in which case you wouldn't need to think about this abstraction. You can just navigate however you feel like it. 
But if it's happening in the view models, it becomes shareable across the two. Um, so the Blazor implementation of that needs to use the navigation manager class. Um, and it always uses URL navigation. And it uses that route syntax, um, which goes presenter slash detail and then the ID or something like that. So that's how you would pass in an ID. Um, you can't pass in POCOs or plain old class objects. You can only pass around strings or some string-like things. So you can pass ints, GUIDs, date times. Basically, it's got to be able to be serialized and put in the URL bar. Xamarin Forms navigation, on the other hand, there are a few ways you can do it. You can use the navigation page, um, which we've had in Xamarin Forms for quite a while, or you might be using Shell. And even within Shell, there's a few ways of doing things. You can push things and pass through objects, or you can use the Shell URLs. Um, if you're going to be doing that, it uses query string syntax. So something like this, presenters slash detail question mark ID equals one, two, three, four, five, which means we can't use the URLs between the two easily without a bit of um, cleaning up. So what I've got is I've written an iNavigation service, which just has a couple of navigation methods. And then I need to implement it in both forms navigation and in uh, Blazor navigation. What that looks like in my core, I define an iNavigation service because anything in this core project can be accessed everywhere. Um, so I've said I want these two methods, uh, navigate to page async with the URL and a navigate to page async with a URL and a parameter key and a parameter value. Um, in If you want more than one parameter key and more than one value, you're going to need to implement some other methods here. If you want to implement navigating back, that sort of stuff, you can add whatever you like to your interface as long as you can work out how to implement it in both of them. I have also written a navigation service that lets you pass objects, but it was kind of hacky and I don't really like it yet. So until I've got a solution I like, I'm going to stick with this uh, URL-based parameters. So that's that core. Then in my Blazor services, I use a navigation manager, which has been injected here through um, the constructor. Um, so you need to make sure you get a fresh instance of navigation manager for each new page. Um, and as long as you stick to that and you've got this registered transient, you're going to be fine. And then when I call that navigate to page async with a URL, I just say navigation manager dot navigate to. Now, interestingly, this is not an async method, but because I want async in my Xamarin Forms implementation, kind of gone with a compromise. And so I just return a complete task. Um, same thing happened here. There I've got a parameter key and a parameter value. Just navig and then I just do a string format kind of thing because Navigation Manager just wants um, one string URL to go to. Ah, and I have even implemented um, the more complex uh, multi-parameter one here, although I don't think I've used it yet anywhere in this app, but it's going to be coming soon. Of course, the forms implementation, we need one of them as well. We've got the same methods. This one, super clean, just a one-liner. And same here, where we format it with the URL, the parameter key, and the parameter value. Once we've got multiple parameters, that's going to get a bit more complex, um, but definitely manageable. Um, and because we want to await those go to asyncs and we've got the choice of making them uh, animated. That's why we need them in async tasks here. The other thing of interest that kind of shows that the um, interface is a compromise of the two implementations is for the Xamarin Forms version of navigation, we do need a parameter key and a parameter value. 
Whereas in the Blazor version, this parameter key that I pass in just gets completely ignored because uh, it doesn't need it. It just slash separates everything. Um, now, in terms of calling this code, if we look at my presenter's view model, I've got this open presenter method, um, which can either navigate to the page with a new presenter or the one you clicked on. So I say navigation service dot navigate to page async. And we pass in presenters as the base URL slash detail and give it the key and the value. Um, if you're getting into a larger project, you're going to want to put these strings in some consts or something like that, rather than just having inline strings all over the place, because you're going to end up spelling something wrong somewhere. Because these same strings need to match the pages they go to. So over in my Blazor pages, the presenter detail page dot Blazor. Here I register for I'll accept the URL of presenters slash detail, or I'll also accept the URL presenters slash detail with an ID on it. Then in my code behind, I've marked this public string ID get set with a parameter, and that means it knows how to connect it from the Blaze URL into this C sharp. Over in Xamarin Forms, we have to do basically the same thing, but with slightly different syntax, which is on the presenter detail page, XAML CS. We say we've got a query property in here. In the URL, it'll have um, the string presenter, and that maps to a property also called presenter here. Um, which I've made somewhat safe with name of there, but still in the other file, it's just a string. Um, if you want to see a good example of how to wire these URLs up better, um, the most recent stream, stream that Kim and I did on twitch.tv slash Kim Philpots, we spent a lot of time discussing what the best way to do that was, and we got a pretty clean answer. So I'll need to update my demos for that soon. Um, and then over in the app shells AML CS, we do need to register that route as well. Thank you for that link, James. How are we going out there? Too fast, too slow? Any questions? Looks like it's going pretty good here. We had just some conversation about IOC stuff, so I think you're you're good to go. You're awesome. answering all of my questions as you go. So cool, cool. So when it comes to any device specific APIs or any plugins that are out there at the moment that are kind of built for all the Xamarin Forms platforms, but not working on Blazor yet, you kind of got two ways you can come at it. You can either call those things in your view code. Um, the advantage here is it's really quick to get started just in your code behind in your forms projects, you can call any of those forms plugins or in your Blazor page, you can call any uh, Blazor APIs or make some JavaScript calls. Um, problem is that you're going to be writing a lot of that code twice. It probably breaks the MVVM pattern as well if it's some code that you would rather have handled in your view models. The other option is to abstract it into an interface and have it implemented on both. So it's a little bit more work to get it wired up, but it makes it reusable. And it also hopefully puts that code somewhere that is uh, not just reusable across your, well, there's a few levels of reusability here. One, in where you're calling it in your app, um, that code gets reused across Blazor and Xamarin Forms. Um, then the bits that you implement in a service become reusable throughout your app. And then also when you've implemented them in a service that's separated out from your page, 
it means you could contribute it to an open source package or release it as your own nougat. So ideally, what I'll be doing, given I've basically implemented the same APIs that James has done for the media plugin, I should open up a pull request to add Blazor support for that. Um, assuming I can get it up to a standard that works everywhere and not just in my project. Um, so I've got examples of both approaches of that. Um, so in my travel monkey, when I first got this app, it was a completely working uh, Xamarin Forms app for iOS and Android that calls into some Azure services. Um, but because it was built just for Xamarin Forms, it didn't know the problems that I would run into when I ignored the rules of extending this Xamarin app and added a web front end. So originally inside the view model, uh, which will be in this core project on the add picture page, in here there used to be a bunch of calls to the media plugin but that's not allowed anymore because I'm in a core project which can't reference it. So because of kind of the complexities of that API, I went for the approach of just calling it from the view. So in my Xamarin forms, add picture page.xamlcs, instead of when they click the button to take a photo running a command, it's just got some code behind. And in here, I use the media plugin to either use the camera or get something out of the gallery. And then once I've called that and got back a stream, I um, and then convert it into a byte array, I put those byte, that byte array in the view model and post from there. Now, ideally, this method could be a little bit shorter and work on both platforms once I've, if I'd extract, abstracted it out. Now the Blazor equivalent of that in my pages folder, I've got an add picture page. So I've kind of followed the convention of, I've got one page per uh, feature. I give them all the same names across my forms and my Blazor. Here in the code behind of that, I've got a few methods. So when they click take photo, um, hang on, where's the first method? So when you click add picture, it's going to display a dialog. Um, that dialog, all the layout of that I've defined in my Zam, um, in my razor. So I'm just kind of turning on and off the dialogs. Um, so the first thing it'll do is pop up a dialog saying, do you want to use a camera or a um, or the gallery? And then once you've chosen one of them, if you're going to take a photo, we use this um, video media nougat package to capture the image. And then I need to do a few things to clean that up and get it into a byte array ready to be sent off. And once again, put it in the view model post it off. Or if instead they choose to upload a file, handle file selected, they we get the image that's been input here. And once again, put in the view model, post it off. So that's kind of the calling from the view approach. The other thing I've been doing, which I don't actually call in any either of these projects, is anywhere I use Xamarin Essentials, I'm starting to implement them for Blazor as well. And hopefully I can get enough of them implemented that I can get all these Blazor implementations into the official one. So for example, in a different project, when I needed the um, geolocation APIs, because I'm using them in the mobile app and I want to use them in the browser as well. Um, I 
implement the iGeolocation interface. Um, that comes from Ryan Davis's uh, Xamarin Essentials interfaces plugins, uh, Nougat. Um, and then if I'm in forms, it'll call the original implementations from the proper Nougat package. And if I'm in Blazor, I um, implement it myself. And this is one of those times I needed to use um, JavaScript. So I said JS runtime dot invoke async, and I've already got some JavaScript written, and then it'll uh, pass back that location. Um, I've also done something similar with the geocoding. So this one's using the, uh, the Bing Maps geocoding API, or I've also done it with the Google Maps geocoding API. Um, and also the browser API as part of Xamarin Essentials. I've got that um, mostly implemented here, enough to work for what I want it to do. So if in any of your view models on a command, you say open browser, uh, this will um, open that up in a new tab in the browser if you're in Blazor, or it'll open up Chrome or Safari or whatever on your device. Um, so for example, in the about page, looks like I haven't implemented it properly here, but in the original version of this app that learn more would open up the Xamarin Forms docs. Um, what I need to do is tell it to call um, a browser Xamarin Essentials implementation, which if it's on a mobile device, it'll call the official one. If it's on a web, it'll call my implementation. Cool. So what I've talked about so far is kind of how I use Xamarin and Blazor together, but there's so much cool stuff going on out there. Um, Frank Kruger's UI project is not Blazor, but it is Xamarin Forms and WebAssembly. That's super cool. There's also the Blazor mobile bindings and also the people at Uno doing cool stuff. So Blazor mobile bindings, that means you write a mobile app that will run using all the Xamarin Forms controls and stuff like that. But instead of using XAML, you're going to be using uh, CSHTML and all that Razor syntax instead. Um, so this doesn't make a Razor page run on your phone, nor does it mm, the code you write here let you run it in the web. What it does is it gives you skills reuse. So if you don't want to have to learn how to write XAML and um, Razor, or even if you know both, if you don't want a team of developers switching back and forth between two languages, if you write um, Razor syntax, you can write your Xamarin Forms apps. So this is kind of a similar concept to React Native, um, except instead of writing JavaScript and it giving you um, native UI elements, you write Blazor and it gives you native UI elements. So this is really cool. And they're doing a lot of stuff kind of experimenting with where that boundary between Xamarin Forms and Blazor sits and all sorts of interrupt. Um, it's experimental at the moment, but it's really cool. Um, then there's UI by Frank Kruger. That lets you write Xamarin Forms XAML that will then run in the browser. Um, and that can also do either server-side or WebAssembly. Um, I believe he's just updated it quite recently on Twitch, although unfortunately I'm always asleep while Frank's on Twitch. Um, this has the potential for huge code reuse, um, well beyond what I've been showing here, because uh, you can use those views across everything. Um, and that one's free and open source, so I need to spend more time in UI. I've dabbled a little, but I want to do more. Um, and then Uno is the other um, approach. This is where you write um, um, a UWP app, and then it can run anywhere. So you're using UWP XAML, or perhaps you're writing a Xamarin Forms app that can target UWP, 
and then run it anywhere. So you can get your Xamarin form XAML or your UWP XAML running in WebAssembly or iOS, Android, Windows, Mac. This is another example of huge code reuse beyond what I've looking at, been looking at, because you really can use those user interfaces anywhere. So Uno, really cool as well. Um, getting further off topic, um, <laughs> that Melbourne Modern Apps app that I've been working on, I work on that weekly-ish on a Tuesday or Wednesday morning. Um, adding any new features and trying out all the new Blazor and Xamarin stuff. Um, so if anyone's got some cool stuff they want to try out in my app, I'd love to have you as a guest on Twitch. Otherwise, tune in and you can see me working on it. Um, for anyone uh, wanting to get into Blazor, highly recommend um, this book by Ed Charbonneau, who works for Telerik. Um, Blazer Beginner's Guide, and he does a lot of Twitch streaming as well, doing Blazer stuff. And this is my last slide with just a few links and details. Um, so down the bottom, there's all my URLs. Um, I'm on GitHub, Twitter, Twitch, everywhere. as well on W Gordon. Um, I've got a blog post out, which is what originally caught James's eye, Blazor Xamarin code sharing. It's basically the same content I've covered here today, but in blog format. And these slides I'm presenting now, you can go to bit.ly slash Blamarin. Um, as I mentioned, I stream on Twitch. When I say Tuesday mornings, I mean Monday 4 p.m. Seattle time. And... Kim and I do another weekly stream working together. Um, that's, I believe, 4 a.m. Wednesday for you. So I think we mostly get Europeans and Australians in that one. Um, we have a lot of fun working together on Twitch. Um, so I'd love to see you all hanging out in the chat room on those two. That's all my content, but happy to answer as many questions as we got and to dig into more code. If there's anything you want to look more at? I think Otherwise, that's, thank you. Yeah, so far, thank you, Lachlan. It's, it's pretty much awesome. And I really like how you went through all the different components. And it definitely answered a lot of my questions along the way, which is awesome. Uh, I think we had a lot of good discussion in the chat. Anyone can chime in if they have any more chats. But mostly it's been kind of in chill mode now that the cat has left. Yeah. So I mean. <laughs> What's the point? This is having a sleep behind me. Uh, oh, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Also, I'll put all the links into the show notes and also, yeah, because the slides are already there. So I'll put the, the links down there. And then this video is also available on demand via the same link as well. So, and they're all on the uh, <coughs> Down at Foundation YouTube mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. I think that's it. Thanks for Crushed it. Thanks everyone for coming along. Yeah, thank you so much for taking time out of your. I don't even know what time it is over there. Afternoon, morning, evening. Yeah, it's afternoon now. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, we'll go enjoy your afternoon. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Hope you enjoy your beautiful Sunday evening. Where anyone in the chat is in Seattle or wherever you're at in the world. Um, Lachlan, thank you so much again. Bye. All right. Bye everyone. We'll see you maybe next month. And we're going to end the stream. See if this works. Bye.